Um, this is the USDA plant hardiness zone map. This is an important thing to have access to. Anybody know what zone we're in here? Seven. Seven what? I think we're in 7B in the city, personally. And I think we could almost be coming in, depending on how, how urban of an area you live in, the heat sink in a city is pretty intense. So I think parts of Richmond actually might even be in 8. Um, and so what that does is that tells you what the frost dates are. The first frost and last frost. Um, so when your plants, and you probably see it in the back of the packets, they'll have a very rough sketch of, of this, and it'll tell you when you can start to put your seeds out. The other thing that we're missing, though, this is about the, the, the frost dates. One of the things that's happening with climate change, and in this region, we're getting hit pretty hard by it, is that flowers on your Fruiting plants, like the tomatoes and the peppers and the eggplants, if it doesn't get below, I think it's 85 degrees at night for an extended period of time, the flower does not get triggered to turn into the fruit. And so it can handle the daytime temperatures if it's watered adequately, but it's the nighttime temperatures because we're not, it's not cooling off at night like it used to, that this is becoming more of a problem. You know, okra, cantaloupe, your melons, they seem to do okay, but some of our other summer veggies that we love are having a hard time figuring out what's going on. They're like, wait a minute, this is not what I signed up for. Um, microclimates. So you can create microclimates very, very easily in your own garden by using things like um, uh, bricks or cobblestones or anything that will hold on to heat during the day. So if you want to get a garden going a little bit earlier, you can create a microclimate. By, I have an area in my garden that I have got a row of cobblestones, and it's just a very thin garden bed, but the cobblestones will heat up so much during the day just from the sunlight I can get a jump start in getting my greens going in the spring. Um, and then you could also do very simple cold frames by uh, using plastic over something, and that will create a microclimate or uh, an old window. Um, so what you're trying to do is just either heat, you can't really cool it down, but you can heat things up earlier. The cold winters um, are good because they do kill some of the, the bad bugs, which we cannot have enough death of bad bugs. Um, and it does, you know, plants need to be, some of the seeds have to go through a cold spell in order to be triggered to germinate in the spring. And that's called, I think it's called striation. So some of the more complex, if you've ever bought some of the more uncommon seeds, and it will say that you need to striate them, you, you basically, you keep them in the refrigerator or the freezer for a little while, and that will trick them into thinking they've gone through. Um, okay, use the right tool for the right job. A really good pair of pruners and a good pair of scissors is essential. So make sure that you have bypass pruners, not, not a pair of pruners that clamp onto each other, because that will just crush the stem and maybe break it off, which can damage your plant and let um, you know, bad things get in there. You want to make sure that whatever you have crosses all the way through to cut through. And learn how to use a file and keep your tools sharp. You know, and so invest $5.99 in a, in a file and practice keeping your tools sharp. Even a shovel, keeping your shovel sharp will help you um, with your back. If you have a bad back or if you're getting old, um, you might want to. You know, learn how to sharpen shovels and different tools and your mattocks and whatnot. Um, I think like sprayers and stuff, I think it's really worth investing a little bit of money into these kinds of sprayers. You know, this here has a pump, so you actually pressurize it and then you just hit a little button and that will shoot um, things out. So using things like insecticidal soaps and whatnot, you want to get some good sprayers. Um, and you know, I, I recommend investing in some high
high quality tools and learn how to oil them properly. Keep, keep them in good working order and the wood, you know, get linseed oil and rub it in. Like it's your relationship again. These are your, these are your companions that you want to have with you and don't lend them to anybody. So, so like they'll get their own. Right tool for the right job. All right, composting. I'll skip through this and let you do it, but, um, you know, composting is... I did get to look at my compost through a 100x microscope recently, and I saw a protozoa, and a nematode, and a flagellum, is that how you say it? And some mycelial thread, and that was really thrilling to see a protozoa. They're just like... Doop, 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 doop. And the nematodes are like, what can I eat, what can I eat, what can I eat, what can I eat? And the flagellums are like, whoosh. There, that was pretty fun. Um, okay, the carbon and nitrogen ratio, again, with your compost. You know, you don't have to go crazy with it, but just remember, try to get in your brain, like, what has the more carbon. And so, if you cut your grass, and it's nice and green, there's a lot more nitrogen in it. But if you cut your, you know, right away, it's laying there, it's pretty nitrogen heavy. You cut your grass, leave it there for a couple of days, it becomes more carbon heavy. So the browner and crispier it is, the more carbon that's in it. The wetter and juicier it is, the more nitrogen that's in it. Um, in an urban area, if you don't have a lot of space, you can really have a lot of fun and grow vertically. They, you know, these like watermelons, they're, they're pretty strong. They, they can hang on, but you know, you might want to put a little kind of like a hammock and figure out a way to do it. I was I thought this was cute, but you would have to water this like every four hours in the summer. Unless you figure out some way to get some irrigation going. You can grow out of buckets. Um, this is I thought was kind of cool. These are like grocery bags that somebody's growing out of it. But again, this stuff is gonna have to be watered quite a lot. Uh, and you know you can just alley shop and find so much cool stuff that for a way to, to build a garden. Um, companion planting. I, I just thought this was a really lovely diagram that somebody made. Uh, but you can find all kinds of diagrams and charts for companion planting and find out some plants do really like each other and some plants don't. Some plants will knit their um, roots together and that's what the companion planting is. And some plants, which are, I think they're called alleopathic, they actually will put a chemical out through their root systems that will kill every anything that gets near it. Um, and so that this is something that you could just have a lot of fun with and research on yourself with companion planting. Um, mulching, I talked about this a little bit already. Mulch heavily, this will keep the weeds down and the moisture in your soil. Also, worms, I don't know what it is about rotting cardboard, but worms seem to love to have sex in rotting cardboard and have lots of babies, and that's what you want. All right, good bugs versus bad bugs. Uh, when I, sometimes when I teach kids, I just tell them that gardening is all about sex and death. Um, and when it comes to bugs, that's that's the truth. So this is pretty cool. Do you guys know what that is? The tomato corn worm with the parasitic wasp eggs on it. So this wasp will lay there, and they're good. Parasitic wasps are good because they'll kill the bad bugs. But it lays, it looks like grains of rice on this. The tomato corn worm is going to be about that big. And they will basically suck the life out of the tomato corn worm. Which, they're cool looking, but these things will devour a tomato plant pretty fast. Um, so if you see one of these, let it, let it be. Ladybugs, they're very good. They eat a lot of aphids. Praying mantises are good, and who doesn't like the mythology around praying mantises? Um, all of our pollinators, you know, you've got lots of kinds of bees and moths and wasps and flies. In your garden, it's a really good idea to mix it up what we call the umbels, which are things like dill, um, let some cilantro go to seed, things that have a lot of teeny weeny little flowers on it. I like to call it a pollination station. 
And those will attract lots of pollinators. So you want to try and get as many pollinators as you can in your garden. I've heard that, you know, you've probably all heard of the colony collapse disorder with the bees that we're seeing. I've heard that in China it is so bad now that they're actually having to hand pollinate a lot of their crops. And so, you know, the bees and the worms, they're, they're our workers. And we need to make sure that we give them good habitat. The garden, this garden orb spider, these things get huge. So if you have one in your garden, you'll probably have a few. Let them be. Be nice to them. Um, harlequin bugs, this is all they do. They have sex. They lay these little eggs. They hatch tons of babies. And then they do it again. My great joy is killing them when they're doing it. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> and basically there's no, there's, you have to do it called mano y mano. There are no gentle chemicals that will take care of these things. You gotta get out there and you gotta use your hands. They love, they will eat all of your broccoli, they will eat many of your lettuces. Um, they do, like you can plant some some plants will attract different bugs. These happen to love Cleome, and you can, they, that will pull them out of your garden because they would prefer to be on your Cleome, but they love it so much. It's like an aphrodisiac for them, and they just will fight it faster. So, what's Cleome? It's also called a spider flower. It's, um, it's got a purple, it's kind of, these crazy spikes come out, and these, it's like a firework of pink. Flowers come out of them, and the leaves look a little bit like weed. So if you're saying plants them over to the side, and they'll stay over there. Yeah, they'll 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 tend to stay up, stay over there. They love it. The stink bugs are starting to be a pretty big problem, um, and that's another thing. But What's the answer with stink bugs? You know, I don't know. I think again, insecticidal soaps with these things probably are. Okay. You gotta give it a shot. I accidentally I was being greedy in a garden once and eating some raspberries and I there was a stink bug on one and I put it in my mouth. <laughs> and I didn't crunch on it, but it released its stink in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it was nasty. <laughs> So, um, perennials and annuals, 
it's nice to figure out a way to have a mix of those as well in your garden, like, you know, rhubarb and depending on how much rhubarb you have, if you can get blueberries in there and strawberries. Um, perennial vegetables in this climate, not, there's not so much that you can do with that. Although, I have had, I have parsley still alive right now. I've got some kale that's made it. Um, but again, because we're, I think, my personal perception of what's going on with climate change is that we're going to have to figure out a way to have um, a longer fall season, a little bit more of a robust winter, and into spring and our summers, we're going to have to figure out a way to either start a second crop in late summer so that you can harvest in the fall, or in midsummer so you can harvest in the fall. It's just going to be, we're, we're in some unknown territory right now. Um, you know, with your annuals, again, if you let them go to the seed in the garden, chop them back in or let the wind take them wherever they want to go, you almost get a perennial out of it just because it's seeding itself. The pollination station, again, really important. And one of the things I really like to do, um, especially with kids, is if you have something that's, um, you know, a poly-headed, uh, sunflower or something with a lot of flowers, when you walk up to it, all the, the insects that were in there, they're just going to scatter. They're like, oh, here's those stupid, clumsy humans with their thumbs. But if you stop and you're very still for about five minutes, they'll all come back and you can watch this incredible, busy, it's like a skyscraper for, for insects. And they're all doing their work and then the spiders come back out and they're, they're like, being very still, and you can you can watch a spider catch a little fly and kill it, and I don't know. I think it's kind of neat. Um, and then, so the harvesting and storing. One of the things about growing your own food is be prepared to spend a lot of time harvesting, washing, storing, cleaning. You know, it's not like going into the grocery store and getting clean food, which has chemicals on it. So it's a different. It looks clean, but it's not. So, you know, make sure that you prepare, you have that time put into your whole gardening world of what are you going to do with all this food that you're growing. Um, and then storing, you know, you can can food, your root veggies you can keep over the winter, your, um, any of the hard squash like butternut and acorn, you can keep those. So, you can dry food, um, you could trade it with your neighbor, there's just, you know, it's all another part of this process. I think I read recently that the average American spends 30 minutes a day cooking, eating, and cleaning up. That's it. You know, and I, it's weird. Sometimes I think how, it's weird how much time I spend every day in my food it's part of my life. <laughs> this is a lot more than that. Um, okay, some common mistakes. Planting too much too closely. That's a big one. When a carrot seed is the size of a grain of sand, it's hard to imagine that a carrot seed, you know, that 100 carrot seeds, which you can barely see in your hand, 100 carrot seeds is going to, you know, make a line of carrots this long. And that one watermelon seed is going to give you a plant that might grow, you know, half the length of this room. And so, it, when you're planting, make sure that you follow the guys that tell you how far away to plant. Do not, try not to overplant because if you crowd it, it's also a nutrient thing. They, they can't get enough nutrients because they're sharing and they, they won't grow well and, you know, they'll cram into each other. It's like wearing shoes that are too small. It's just not going to work. It's going to hurt. Um, water too much. That can cause rot in the roots. It can cause um, mold to grow. Um, close to the ground for the leaves that are close to the ground. Watering, not enough. You'll be able to tell with that. It's like not enough pruning. Do not be afraid to prune. I think it's, you know, it's a little bit scary at first because you don't know what to cut off. But pruning, um, it will make for a much healthier plant if you, then they all have different pruning needs and it's just, over time you can, you'll learn what you want to cut off. So you, you can cut off certain parts of the plant and that will allow to send more nutrients into the fruiting part, for example. And deadheading, zinnias, for example, the more you cut zinnias, the more flowers you will get. And um, I think cosmos the same way, so with, with flowers especially, 
it's, it's really good to, to cut. Um, not catching and set problems early enough, we talked about that. You know, you really want to get in there and get those eggs out of there. And um, water at the wrong time of the day. You want to generally try and water in the earliest in the morning. If you do it, I mean, it's okay. If, if it's an emergency and everything's dying and it's 110 degrees outside, you want to water it. But if you do it when it's really hot, that can create more mold because it's hot and moist and the bacteria that you don't want are like, yeah. <coughs> Thanks for setting us up. Um, right plant, wrong season. Um, you know, there's some stuff that, like broccoli, is not going to be particularly happy to be out there in July and August. I find that if it's not, if, if you don't have a head by Memorial Day, you're just, it's just going to be full of worms. The broccoli? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so now, I think that, 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 that they all do better if you can get them started in the summer um, toward the fall because the, the, the cold will knock the worms down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and know what your soil needs. And remember, it's all, it's all a learning experience. You know, make mistakes because that's the only way you're going to learn. Well, no, that's not. It's one of the ways you're going to learn. Um, and again, you are what you eat. Uh, I think this is roasted corn. It's in, it is just. It's very interesting to see over how the past 15 years we are starting to have much more public discussions about this. But you know, it's a it's a hugely complex topic. We are of the earth. Our molecules are of the earth, and. Uh, there's such a, I, I recently had a meeting with some people that I thought would have be a little bit more informed about some of the things around, you know, the, the um, kind of some of the ecological systems that we're, we're pushing the edge of right now. And to me, one of the really scary ones is, is ocean acidification. And so basically the oceans can't absorb a whole lot more carbon which is a problem because that means there's going to be more going up into our atmosphere. And what's happening with our oceans absorbing the carbon is that is compromising our coral reefs, right? Which is the spawning ground of pretty much the entire ecosystem of the, the um, seas. And we're getting pretty close to redlining right now with the ocean acidification. And if that tips, that's where most of our oxygen comes from. Now, the planet is not going to discern how rich you are, you know? It doesn't, you're not going to be able to buy oxygen with all the cash you have in your bank account if this tips. And I was having a meeting with somebody who happened to have a lot of cash in their bank account. They could not compute that they had anything to do with ocean acidification and that ocean acidification had anything to do with them. And I think this is what we all need to be working on as we are understanding about how we're living on this planet is that we it is, it's all connected and all of our actions and behaviors are a part of it. We are, our molecules in our body did not come out of the thin air. They were something else. It's at some other time and you can get way woo woo with it or you can be straight up science. We are, our molecules energetically, it's just a transference of of energy at trophic levels of ecology. And that cuts all the romance out of it. Um, and we can go into a, a philosophical, spiritual discussion, but you, we are what we eat, and we need to, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing. And I, I hope that we can get there pretty soon. So that's it. At the beginning, you said not to not to fill up the soil too much. Mm -hmm. So, so are you saying not to do that double digging process that they talk about for a new Double bed digging or? is usually only recommended for the first time you're you're prepping a bed. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do double dig every year. Okay. So the double digging is is if it's a it's a garden that has never been worked before or a new area that's never been. 
So but it's okay the one time. The one time, absolutely. That also pulls up some of the soil where the nutrients are down low, brings them up to the top. And it's a good way to get a lot of weeds out too. What's your idea on um, hydroponics or aquaponic gardening in like a location in the city? Like if you don't have a yard or anything. I think it's great. And I think there's we, we need to see more and more and more of it, especially the aquaponic hydroponic combo. For sure. And I think that that's a part of the future of how we're going to be feeding ourselves in a large scale. Mm -hmm. yep. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lazy. I think if I, and I, I was discussing this with somebody that saves every bit of compost and has a small yard. Um, they were just digging, making holes in the yard and throwing the compost in a cover of dirt. Now, you know, if I, and I'll do this to my garden, I just take the compost out there and we till it in. Mm -hmm. I mean, straight from the kitchen. Oh, you're not composting it? It's kind of, it's kind of just doing its own thing. Uh-huh. I get, you know, the thing is, maybe just experiment, see what works. It works. If it works. Sorry, wherever I put it, it things are growing like crazy. You know, one way that people do actually work with using, um, and they call them, I think, biopores. So if you have a, a lawn or an area that you have a little bit of time, a few years maybe, that you want to eventually have a garden in, you can actually take an auger and auger out holes, you know, maybe this big around and this big, this deep, and just jam them full of your compost and leaves and manure, and then cover them up. And so they will be their own little, like, hole of nutrient-rich activity. And the worms will come in and pull it back out and go into the, the more compacted soil with the less nutrients in it. And you get a bunch of those going into a piece of property, and then you come in a few years later, and it should have, you know, all that stuff should have migrated. But it's not a fast process. No. But sure, why not? Um, so I've... Um heard about people you know putting logs in like raised beds and uh -huh. then decompose and that helps with moisture yeah moisture. have you had any experience and you think that's with what like you have decomposing logs a log. in the garden bed and so then that's a way of having to water less it's called a hugel culture mm -hmm. is like i don't know if that was named after somebody uh, it was a german guy named sepp holzholz or swiss guy sepp holzer has been doing a lot of work with this okay and what they're what he's doing and it has been really successful is basically let's say it's this is going to be your bed here but it's on the ground you dig up let's say it's a grassy area you dig that a, a trench fill it with logs and bring it up a little bit and take that soil that you have dug up and then put that on the top of it and as the wood is high in as it rots, is high in mycelial activity. The soil in woods has a higher mycelium to bacterial ratio than the soil in a garden has a higher bacterial to mycelial ratio. And what that does with the rotting of the woods, it, it creates this, this humus with a lot of mycelial activity in it and a lot of moisture, and it's very nutrient rich as it breaks down. And, did, and does that also help with, I mean, that, that was the reason I was interested in actually generating some extra moisture, so uh -huh. the, the, it needed to be watered less often, and yep. I didn't know if that... It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so it definitely okay. Yep. Well, they, uh, they're saying now yeah, that if you just get mulch, you mulch uh -huh. it with pine bark or whatever, I mean, you plant your plants and just mulch, mm -hmm. um, that's, it, it, it's, it's working out well for the... Yeah. You know, you get wood chips or whatever, and uh, they thought at one point that it would pull nitrogen away from the plants, but it, it could be this what you're saying with the mushroom stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mycelial. The biggest one that they found on the planet is something like 20,000 acres, and it's one, it's an organ, and it's considered one continuing, continuous living organism. That's really freaky. And it connects all the. the Plants underneath. Avatar. Yeah, it really is. Avatar, Avatar is yeah. really about mycelium. I, <laughs> I think Avatar is real. <laughs> All right, so okay. there's no yes or no answers. <coughs> it's a complex, beautiful system.
Well, thank you, Lisa. Can we get an extra bit of bad as visuals? No, these are for you. All right, next up we have uh, Bruno Welsh from uh, Campos RPA. Thank you. 